Thank you very much, Eduardo, for the invitation. And um, given that I'm not a moral philosopher, I will contribute to the discussion reflecting about moral judgments with the help mainly of recent neuroscientific research on emotions, connectionist approaches and in this field and um, uh, some embodied cognition intuitions, but these last <laughs> ones um, will probably fall out today. So I will here presuppose that experimental philosophy isn't, strictly speaking, uh, uh, part of neuroscience. If one takes into consideration the psychological theory of mind and the biological hypothesis of the social brain, and at the same time reflects about how to achieve scientific knowledge of mental or behavioral moral dispositions, I think that at the end one will have to concede that even if we are able to identify many specific emotions linked to specific moral judgments, there is a plurality of possible emotional responses linked to moral thought and evaluations, which induces the defense of an affective pluralism in the analysis of the so-called moral reactions. So, I will follow this sequence of thought. I will start speaking about emotions and many aspects of neurological research of emotions. And then I will, issues, I will, I will speak about moral cognitions and moral sensitivity. To be able to conclude uh, to have some conclusions about uh, the link between emotions and moral cognitions. I know that many people are doing that right now, but I think that we should try to, to emphasize in philosophy more what neuroscience is doing and how neuroscience can be relevant to uh, philosophical reasoning. Since Darwin's analysis of basic emotions, we know that some of them are universal. At the same time, we know that their variations and combinations are impressive numerous. If we suppose that moral judgments are based ultimately in emotional evaluations, emotional approval or disapproval of human behavior, even if rationalizations and justifications accompany or follow this kind of evaluations, at, and at the same time, the variety of emotions is impressive, why should we suppose that just some of them are responsible or accompany moral judgments? I won't uh, answer uh, completely these questions, but um, these are my questions. I, I think they are important. Second, if moral judgments would be a result, even if just partially, of certain precise and singular emotions, as empathy or repulsion, besides the problem of identifying a precise emotion, we have the problem of knowing if this is enough for the final judgment or with which other emotions it has interact during the moral evaluation. Obviously, if one separates moral judgments from emotional evaluations, affective sensitivity related to moral judgments, this wouldn't be a problem but I am supposing that these are essential for any moral judgment. 
So we have many kinds of possible categorization of emotions, of primary and secondary emotion, for example, Parrot's classification of primary emotions like love, joy, surprise, anger, sadness, fear, and secondary emotion where you have pride, optimism, relief, surprise, rage, disgust, envy, suffering, sadness, shame, sympathy, and so forth. I, I will quote uh, some uh, definitions of uh, Damasius that try to list and to explain what emotions are, but uh, just to have in view the, what we are talking about. Still with folk psychology concepts, but uh, knowing or trying to explain what emotion is in a physiological, from a physiological point of view. So Damasio says that the mention of the word emotions usually calls to mind one of the six so-called primary or universal emotions, like happiness, sadness, fear, anger, surprise, or disgust. You see, categorizing, there are many uh, kinds of categorizing of uh, category lists of emotions. At the same time, he says, it is important to note that there are numerous other behaviors to which the label emotion has been attached. They include so-called secondary or social emotions, such as embarrassment, jealousy, guilt, or pride. And what I call background emotions, such as well-being or malaise, calm or tensions. The label emotion has also been attached to drives and motivations and to the states of pain and pleasure. Emotions, says uh, Damasio, are complicated collections of chemical and neural responses forming a pattern. All emotions have some kind of regulatory role to play leading in one way or another to the creations of circumstances advantages to the organism exhibiting the phenomenon. Emotions are about the life of an organism, its body to be precise, and their role is to assist the organism in maintaining life. I, really, I have some, two other uh, Damasio's code. In, um, so basically emotions uh, are basic organic functions that regulate adaptations. As Damasio says, in other words, the bio biological purpose of the emotions is clear and emotions are not a dispensable luxury. Emotions are curious adaptations that are part and parcel of the machinery with which organisms regulate survival. O old as emotions are in evolution, they are fairly high level component of the mechanism of life regulations. You should imagine this component as sandwiched between the basic survival kit metabolism, reflex, motivations, etc., and the devices of high reasons, with, but still very much a part of the hierarchy of life regulation devices. For less complicated species than humans and for absent-minded humans as well, emotions actually produce quite reasonable behaviors from the point of view of survival. The biological function of emotions is twofold, and I will, I will quote just the first one. The first function is the production of a specific reactions to the inducing situation. In an animal, for example, the reaction may be to run or to become 
immobile or to beat the hell out of the enemy or to engage in a pleasurable behavior. In humans, the reactions are essentially the same, tempered one hopes by higher reason and wisdom. So I will follow some papers that are uh, in the last years or maybe the last two decades um, trying to explain how how to see or how to detect emotions in the brain. And so I will, I will quote many, some of these, uh, these papers, yes. And one of them uh, is about uh, how to, to see emotions uh, in a fMRI, yes. And at the same time, uh, get to some conclusions that, that are opposed to the view that we could uh, detect a specific brain uh, networks for each basic emotions, yes? So, Linquist, Alexander Linquist, uh, Dickerson, and Barrett, they, they achieved a conclusion that basic emotions aren't correlated to specific brain networks in the sense that uh, you have many parts of the brain interacting connecting at the same time when emotions uh, take place, uh, basic emotions take place. Yeah. So emotion must be seen as a kind of, in the brain, as a kind of overlap of many um, networks and not just one network. Uh, so they say it, emotion is a kind of domain general network and not a specific network. And here you see some of the images they achieved and they call, um, and they, they think with these images they, they prove or they have evidence for the conceptual act theory of emotions. We've hypothesized that emotions are constructed from the interaction of domain general core systems within the brain and are not specific, are not correlated to specific network in a specific area. So a complex emotions are uh, a really complex uh, phenomenon in the brain. Okay. Uh, so what, what is moral cognition and what is moral sensitivity? I, I won't explain it, but I, want, I will follow some reasoning that tries to explain moral cognition and moral sensitivity with neuro, uh, neuroscientific uh, images and evidence and hypotheses. There is a very nice paper from 2005, uh, the neurobasis of human moral cognition, uh, Mol et El Ali. Uh, where the researchers detect the main areas linked to moral evaluations and judgments. I will uh, read some of their conclusions about the topic. In addition to prefrontal cortex, other brain regions are crucial for moral cognition. Structural changes in the anterior 
temporal lobes, either acquired or developmental, can also impair moral behaviors. So all paper is based on dysfunctions or uh, in the comparison of healthy and not healthy or normal or uh, brains and brains that have some kind of impairment. So dysfunction of neural circuits that involve the superior temporal sulcus region, a key area for social perception, is associated with the difficulty experienced by individuals with autism in attributing intentionality, which leads to reduced experience of pride and embarrassment. Lesions to limbic and paralimbic structures can impair basic, basic motivational mechanisms, such as sexual drive, social attachment, and aggressiveness, leading to extreme moral vi violations, for example, unprovoked physical assaults and pedophilia. Structural and functional imaging studies in psychopathic individuals have pointed to abnormalities in almost all these regions. There is remarkable agreement between functional imaging and clinical anatomical evidence about the brain areas involved in moral cognition. Activated regions include, in, include the anterior prefrontal cortex, orbitofrontal cortex, posterior uh, superior temporal sulcus, anterior temporal lobes, insula, pecunious anterior cingulate cortex, and limbic regions. Notably, the wide range of modalities, stimuli, and task requirements in moral judgments appear to have little effect on brain activation patterns. So they detected a kind of limit to the research because they, they couldn't really uh, detect dif uh, substantial differences in some of the tests. So the different tests resulted in the same activation. So that's a problem. Um, they, they also commented, commented and uh, try to reflect um, on what the, this, this, evi this neurological evidence would, uh, in, in what sense these evidences would uh, contribute to philosophical uh, discussions. And they concluded that Green, I, I quote, Green and colleagues used a moral judgment task that involved classic moral dilemmas and found similar activation of the anterior prefrontal cortex. Scenes associated with basic emotions such disgust and fear activated similar brainstem and limbic regions, including the amygdala, but not the medial orbitofrontal cortex and the superior temporal sulcus. These findings are consistent with the hypothesis that a network involving the, the anterior prefrontal cortex, um, orbitofrontal cortex, uh, and uh, the, the sulcus, and limbic region represents social emotional events linked to moral sensitivity and automatic tagging of ordinary social events with moral values. This hypothesis was supported by the finding that the medial orbital frontal cortex, anterior PFC, STS, and precunius show increased coupling in a functional connectivity analysis, and by the observation that a similar set of region is involved in moral reasoning and social perception. So, Attitudes that relate to sensitive issues such as war, murder, and abortion activate networks involving different P 
PFC sectors, limbic and paralimbic regions, and the anterior temporal cortex. In our view, they conclude the moral values and moral emotions involved in specific situations directly influence implicit and explicit moral appraisal. They agree with, uh, with some philosophers, obviously, that uh, so um, moral judgments are linked to emotions, but not just that that they concluded that uh, we can detect the areas activated during moral judgments and also uh, some uh, brain regions that are linked to basic emotions. So uh, this is a really uh, nice uh, research that gives us a, a, a a not a precise, but a really good map of brain activations during moral judgments. There is another paper of the Seti and Cowell, friends of Fuss, is empathy necessary for moral behavior from 2014, where they uh, also uh, achieved a kind of map of the activations of the brain uh, during moral uh, evaluations. And then you have uh, in this, uh, this picture what the network of interconnected regions implicated in moral cognitions labeled in the sagittal, horizontal, and coronal sections of an average structural magnetic resonance imaging scan. So you have activations in the medial prefrontal cortex, anterior cingulate cortex, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, insula, posterior superior temporal sucos and amygdala. What you see is that you have uh, some regions that are linked to bodily feelings, to perception, to positive and negative uh, sensory inputs uh, for the goals and motivations of the perceiver, for example, the amygdala, you have uh, so many, many, many areas that interact during moral uh, judgments. Not just areas linked to emotions, obviously, but also areas linked to emotions. And uh, the posterior superior temporal sulcus that is linked to to how we perceive social behavior, and how we react to others' intentions. So this, the posterior superior temporal circles is very important for, for social interactions. And you have all these areas um, activated dur uh, during moral judgments. Uh, for example, the medial prefrontal cortex is responsible for understanding mental states of others and oneself. So th this is a region where you have uh, more reasoning than uh, emotional uh, reaction or, emotion, or uh, a region where you are processing emotions. Uh, so you see, the, 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 the scan captures all the interactions w w w that are happening in the brain. So what, w w why is this useful for us? There is a, a paper of uh, Ivor and Marcherie and Cushman uh, uh, 
is utilitarian sacrifice becoming more morally permissible from last year, 17, where they say, I will quote, leading theories credit highly acclaimed instances of moral progress to the exercise of rational scrutiny over prevailing moral norms and the persistence of parochialism and prejudice to the invariable comment of intuitions and of intuition. From this perspective, greater disapproval of intuitive deontological principles among recent cohorts may stem from the documented rise in cognitive abilities and foreshadow an expanding commitment to the welfare maximizing re resolution of contemporary moral challenges. So I, what's the paper about? The paper is about the, uh, how people are uh, changed, changed evalu uh, evaluations, moral evaluations in the last decade or so. Uh, so that, um, what they, they, they detected uh, is that uh, people are m more, uh, they, they feel more comfortable to make uh, utilitarian judgment, judgments about uh, in, in, in when they are told to, to evaluate morally. So, um, what, what can we conclude about? What, are, are people getting more rational? Are people getting less emotional? These are questions that they, they put in the paper and they try to, they, they don't try really to answer, but they, at the end they, they reflect if the, it is something positive or negative to have people thinking in a more supposedly more rational way, utilitarian way, than in a, a way that would um, requir require, require more empathy. So, at the end, uh, so they, they conclude that uh, there are at least two uh, possible uh, inferences that we can do from all the tests that they, they performed. And I see the last uh, paragraphs as a kind of reflections if moral reasoning is an event, advantage of last of our culture, if moral reasoning is really improving, or is, or is moral reasoning in the sense of really reasoning something that could um, like in psychopathy, could prevent people of using their emotions to evaluate a kind, uh, some a moral behavior. So they they say that on a pessimistic note, one our results dovetail with evidence about the socialization and development of recent cohorts. Utilitarian judgment has been shown to correlate with Machiavellian and psychopathic traits, and also with reduced capacity to distinguish felt emotions. At the same time, leading theories credit highly acclaimed instances of moral progress to the exercise of rational scrutiny over prevailing moral norms and the persistence of parochialism and prejudice to the 
unbridled comment of intuitions. From this perspective, greater disapproval, greater disapproval of intuitive deontological principles among recent cohorts may stem from the documented rise in cognitive abilities and foreshadow an expanding commitment to the welfare maximizing resolution of contemporary moral challenges. What they are saying is that maybe, uh, maybe people are emphasizing or, or activating more cognitive abilities than um, intuitions when they are, when they make moral judgments nowadays. So if that's right, should we see that as an advantage or as that we are where we're improving our moral abilities or sense of justice or is this a regression in the sense that we are not using anymore our animal skills that that uh, ha helped us for many centuries and me, uh, millions of years millions maybe not <laughs> it's, uh, along for a long time uh, to judge what to do to 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 decide what to do in a moral sense in a community. So what can we conclude? One conclusion that we can arrive at is that even if neuroscience is finding neurocorrelates to moral evaluations and judgments, these correlates are still quite vague when we consider the emotions involved in the sense that the activated areas during moral evaluations are related to emotions in general and not just to specific emotions. And even if one would try to link the activations to a specific basic or secondary emotion, the kind of connectivity that instantiates and emotions is broad and complex, rendering identification of a ba basic or secondary emotion indeed seemingly impossible in the context of moral evaluations at the current state of art. Even so, there are attempts. So I will show you some pictures that Mol and uh, Ali use to, 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 to present uh, what neuroscientists have uh, achieved nowadays, and that m maybe one can, could say that these are really, that these pictures are progress. Not just the pictures, but also, the, not just the images, but also the hypothesis they use to explain what happened in the brain. So even, we've, even if we must be in some sense skeptical about uh, identification of moral sensitivity in the brain, we could also be optimistic uh, about a, some kind of explanation of emotions that uh, accompany moral judgment. So I will read uh, here. These are images uh, that explain the event feature emotion complex framework that postulates that moral, cognitive, and behavioral phenomena arise from the binding of three main components. So what we see is not emotion. What we see is a structure, a network that uh, includes as part of it emo, uh, activation of emotional areas. So structure event knowledge provided by context-dependent representations in the prefrontal subregions 
social, perceptual, and functional features stored in the posterior and anterior sectors of the temporal cortex and central motive or basic emotional states such as aggressiveness, sadness, attachment, or sexual arousal represented in limbic and paralimbic regions. So these are all the, par all the areas activating during uh, event feature emotion complex framework. So to conclude, why is neuroscientific research that tries to find neural correlates of moral sensitivity relevant in the discussion of moral judgments? I think that if we accept that emotions are central for moral judgments, even if at some degree culture relative and even if rational values and inference interact with them. Neuroscientific research is essential so as to identify the link between emotions and this kind of judgments. And this will induce us to revise some philosophical concepts as proposed by Moll et Ali, so as maybe to break them down into clear cognitive components or to substitute some of them or even to create new, new ones. Thank you very much. Well, uh, obrigado, Sofia. Perguntas? Uma pena que o Ivar não estava online, já que ele foi citado. Ah, ele não estava, né? é. Não. Eu li alguns artigos, mas é, usei o do Ivar. É, eu não, não conhecia esse. Well, the people on the chat, if you want to, to ask something, just type in it. Well, Sofia, in the end, uh, you put on the spotlight a question about the, the advantage or not of uh, more rational, ra rational uh, moral evaluation, but you don't give us uh, a clear answer, uh, uh, okay. your answer for that, if, uh, if you think is uh, uh, a kind of disadvantage yeah. to... To, to improve yeah. uh, rational capacities and moral cognition. I see as a naturalist, I must see as a kind of disadvantage, but reason is also a capacity that resulted from evolution, so maybe reason can compensate uh, some of our primitive skills of moral judgments. So. Um, because there is an ongoing debate about the, the, the advantage or, or not of empathy. Paul Bloom, uh, for yeah. example, yeah? It's not exactly clear if empathy, for example, is, is, a, is a good guide to moral evaluation. But yeah. I know I that empathy is just I would one say of one, th one conclusion I, I didn't explore so much. But these are all new new reason i this all what i presented is our new informations new contents that i am recently thinking yeah, I about so I it's i i i couldn't um, conclude uh, all what i wanted to but um first of all i i i am I really, um, how can I say that? I, I am confident. I, confident. 
I'm confident, really. <laughs> I'm really confident that emotions help us. So without what we call emotions, we won't, wouldn't be able, and this, this is also concluded by neuroscientific uh, research about psychopaths and so on, uh, and also autism and so on. But we couldn't, we really wouldn't be able to judge morally. So emotions are, are essential. And what I see sometimes is that philosophers and also uh, experimental philosophers are focusing in, uh, in reasoning. So I, I would say we should, we shouldn't obviously uh, throw away reasoning, it's obvious, but at, we, we must reason about causes, we must reason about uh, uh, ends and so on and reasons, but at the same time we need uh, emotions as guides. So we don't have really how to evaluate causes and ends without uh, affective emotions. So, and if we just uh, discuss ways, better or worse ways of reasoning, we are not really doing moral philosophy from my point of view. And therefore, um, I think we need neuroscientific findings on emotions to really understand what is happening during moral judgments, what really is happening. Um, we, it's not enough to speak about how people explain uh, rationally what's happening. It's not enough. We need them not just to, 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 to tell us how they feel, we need them to tell us how they feel phenomenologically, but we also need to try to, to identify physically, physiologically, what's happening inside. I, I, I think emotions, and this is also some uh, that findings show, uh, they change, obviously. We change, uh, culture change our emotions, so we can't say that we are all the same uh, related to emotions, but uh, they are good guides. They are really good guides. So if you want to improve, I, I find also some, some of this uh, kind of proposal of how to improve moral judgments, some of them I find really crazy. So you see, uh, because how could you, how can you from, from a, external perspective, like the philosophical perspective, tell people in, in very specific emotional contexts uh, what they should, how they should uh, feel and reason. And therefore, therefore I, I put emphasis uh, in multiplicity and diversity, variability, because um, philosophers always try to universalize and find a, a general principle or general principles. And I don't think in this case that it's possible. I don't think so. Uh, so we have, uh, set, so as we have multiple um, behaviors in, we have multiple possibility of behaviors in different situations. And so we have po multiple possible moral behaviors. So, and this is really my intuition in relate, related to moral. Therefore, I am not a moral philosopher <laughs> because 
because I'm not, I'm, I don't believe in moral principles. I don't be, really not believe. It's not for me. I believe in, in, in emotions. And I believe we, maybe we could uh, correct some behaviors that we feel that are not helping us, are not helping the community, are not helping our life together. But I don't believe we will find one or 10 or 100 principles, moral principles. I don't think it's possible. If you don't have more questions, I suggest, uh, I'm suggesting a break. <laughs> Okay, thank you, thank you, Sophia.